Welcome to St. Hugo of the Hills Parish Community. This video tells the story of how this magnificent campus was built. It is the story of how the Christian themes of faith, hope, and love are expressed in the art and architecture of the St. Hugo of the Hills Parish Community. The building of the St. Hugo campus has been a coherent vision of Monsignor Anthony Toko, who was appointed pastor in 1985. But who was St. Hugo? He was uh, made abbot at age 27. He reigned for 60 years. He built the largest monastery in Europe at the time, uh, the Abbey at Cluny. He was in charge of 1,300 monasteries and five popes were monks in his monastery over the years that, that he, was, he was the abbot. The stone chapel was built by the Theodore McManus family. Theodore and his wife Alice raised their five children on their Bloomfield Hills estate. Tragically, son Hugo died at age 20 and son Hubert died at age 24. With permission from Bishop Gallagher, they built the stone chapel to memorialize the death of their sons, naming it St. Hugo of the Hills, thus establishing the first Catholic parish community in Bloomfield Hills. By the early 1980s, the St. Hugo's Parish community had far outgrown the original 1936 stone chapel. Upon Monsignor Toko's appointment as pastor in 1985, he started planning for a new church to accommodate the growth of the parish. When the pastoral council finally gave permission for us to design and build a new church, I got a representative from every known group in the parish. We had 28 people on the building committee and they were all nominated by their individual committees. They got together and I said, okay, brainstorm. What is it you need personally? What's on your wish list? What is it, what is it you really want us to do in this building in addition to the church? Well, my husband and I were very pleased to be uh, asked to be the chief fundraisers for this building and we asked the parish to help us by coming forward as volunteers to go house to house with pledge cards to parishioners and we were stunned when 400 of them signed up. They would do the 10, they would come back and they were so excited and pleased they would ask for 10 more and this just went on and on and on. I remember when I was preaching at all the masses right here, uh, trying to tell people about stewardship, and the best way to talk about stewardship is with real stories. A lady that I visited regularly in Presbyterian Village, she was uh, homebound. Her name was Helen Zahn. She was a wonderful woman, and we would bring her communion every week, but I would bring her communion once a month, and every time I brought her communion, she had made me either cookies or uh, a little kind of bread or something that she had to give to me. Well, this one time I was ready to leave, and she said, just a minute, Father, I've been reading about the new church, and I have something for you. She put out her hand and opened mine, and there was a check for $100. Now, I know that after expenses, Helen Zahn lived on $50 a month. That was it. I knew that clearly. I said, Helen, we can't take this from you. She said, you know, your prayers are more important than your money. I know what you live on. You have to take this back. And she gave me this look. She said, you cannot refuse me. You cannot refuse me. You must let me be a part of this program. And I came back and I put that money in the uh, pledge box and I'm telling, I told the people that story and it really touched their hearts and it really opened their wallets because they began to see again the story of the widow's might. It doesn't matter whether it's a dollar, a thousand dollars, three hundred thousand dollars, whoever contributes to this building program, their names are going to be inscribed in calligraphy on a scroll and that scroll is going to be buried in the altar and I'm going to ask God when we dedicate that altar to remember these people every time Mass is celebrated 
on this altar, and we did that. The challenges that we face for the design of the new church uh, at St. Hugo of the Hills, uh, really you can break it down in a number of categories. First of all, the, the, the main issue for us was the not overwhelming the existing chapel. We didn't want to do any harm to uh, that iconic image from Updike Road that we've all grown up with over the years and uh, come to love so well. So one of the nervousness on our part was to make sure that we didn't uh, challenge that image in any way. The issue in that regard really had to do with the scale of the new church at 47,000 square feet and some thousand plus seats in the sanctuary. It was quite a huge program including all of the new choir, meeting room, administration areas, the gallery, the fellowship hall. Quite a large program to put on that site that could easily overwhelm the very small, intimate, uh, beautiful stone chapel. The new church being some 300 feet from point to point, if you can imagine using a roof line that's quite steep, you'd get quite a bit of height out of it, uh, which in our mind be, would begin to challenge the existing chapel itself just in terms of dominance on the site, again, would, which we did, did not want to do. So we started to lower the roof line in our uh, massing studies and drawings that we did and trying to pick just the right height uh, that would allow the new church to have some presence on the site but coexist uh, well with the existing chapel. Another challenge, although I would call it more of an opportunity for us to tie the new church to the existing chapel, had to do with the whole use of materials. The existing chapel, its use of the stone obviously, uh, stained glass windows, uh, the heavy wood pews, uh, brass and iron, uh, all of those elements were an opportunity to incorporate into the new church, which we were able to do. Certainly the stone being the most prominent in that regard, we were very fortunate to have the uh, quarry out of Wisconsin that really where the original stone came from with, for the chapel was still operating and we were able to incorporate that into the overall design of the uh, new church and in fact actually took the whole patterning of the stone, how the stone was cut, the sizes of the stone and so forth, the jointing and all that was actually copied from uh, the original chapel. Uh, the use of the copper roof on the new church obviously uh, is a timeless material. It is, it is uh, worn over time to a nice patina, a nice green, settled into the landscape very well. So it's not flashy, but it's very comfortable and exists well with the existing uh, chapel. The limestone used on the inside and on the pillars obviously recalls the existing church. The use of uh, heavy wood pews with butterfly jointing uh, recalls that. The metal railings used on the steps and so forth, those were all opportunities to tie the existing uh, church together. And when it comes to the glass, obviously the sculpture by Margaret Cavanaugh, uh, which is wonderful, incorporated, uh, we understand, millions left over from the existing church into that design. She did a wonderful t uh, job in that. And then the incorporation of artwork as well with uh, the Stations of the Cross from Suzanne Young. Uh, all of those things were incorporated. Marshall Frederick sculpture in the courtyard, all of those things were you know, drivers for the design. It was 1987 when I was asked to be on the design committee with four other people and as the progress of the church was developing, myself and my family, the Graham family, we decided to donate the uh, stained glass uh, window and it was our honor to do so. Father Tony suggested Margaret Cavanaugh who uh, was already a quite well established stained glass artist. I met with her a number of times. We talked about uh, what was to be done here, and she was the, the artist, obviously. And so she designed and created the Tree of Life. And the theory behind it, as Margaret explained it to me, was that it was the tree of our life's journey, and the crystalline blown uh, fruit is uh, our souls ascending to heaven. And so Margaret uh, developed this, and you can notice from the bottom are very neutral glass colors, but as it ascends up the tree of life, it becomes more vivid, realizing our journey to heaven. And the colors at the top are very vivid and colorful in her work. And uh, so she did that, completed it, and she was quite pleased with it, and uh, viewed it as one of her favorite pieces. 
as the appointments, the liturgical appointments were put into the church as they went up. I think my favorite then and now is probably the um, canopy over the baptismal area. And the reason for that is I thought that it tells in such simple ways so many foundational stories about the function of water from Scripture, both Old Testament and New Testament. For example, from the Old Testament you have the Pharaoh Pharaoh's chariot wheel being swept away um, when Pharaoh and his troops pursued Moses and the Hebrew people. You have Noah's Ark depicted. For New Testament I know you have the uh, water jugs from the wedding feast at Cana. And then probably the most prominent which faces the altar is a double panel and it depicts really just the dove hovering over what looks like the living waters represented in baptism, of course which is right below the canopy. When we were designing the church, and um, Bob Rambush, who did, the, again, the liturgical appointments in the church, proposed to us uh, locating the baptismal font right here. It made perfect sense because really, symbolically, one has to pass through the waters of baptism to approach the altar, um, to, con to receive the other sacraments of initiation, and, and indeed to receive Eucharist itself, which the table of the Lord is what the altar represents. So we thought it was really a perfect and a very fitting placement for it to be right here. On the west side of the church is the magnificent Carillon, topped by the St. Hugo's Cross encased in Italian travertine marble. The carillon is the largest musical instrument of the parish. The sounds of the carillon bells were inspired by the work of Peter and Francois Hemeny, the 17th century founders of Royal Ace Bouts of the Netherlands, the producers of the bells. The main keyboard is located in a small room 57 steps above the ground level. The sound of the carillon can be heard to announce mass and major church events. A unique aspect of the St. Hugo's campus is the columbarium. Special permission from the Catholic Church was received to allow parishioners to be interred in this meditative setting. The columbarium is encountered when one walks the way of the cross connecting the church and the stone chapel.
It was a joy from beginning to end. It was a lot of work from <laughs> beginning to end. <laughs> It is an interesting story because when we really uh, decided to build a church here, the one thing that I noticed in a lot of churches was the organ was out of place because people could afford to build a church and then later on when the church was paid for, they decided to put in a pipe organ and it was never in the place that it was intended to be. So what I really wanted to do from the beginning was design the organ and the church together. And I was thinking about uh, finding someone who can make that as a special gift, and I thought about Hoot McInerney. He was a good friend of mine. Um, I buried his uh, mom in my last parish, and it was a surprise to him and to me when I came here. So I thought about asking him, because he was really capable and very generous in the parish, capable of doing it, but I forgot, I, di I didn't call him for a while, uh, for a long time. I had so many other things going on, and finally he called me, and he said, Father Tony, uh, what do you want me to do for the new church? I said, come on over for coffee. We sat down and we started talking about what he really had wanted to do for his parents. 
Uh, they were simple people. They lived in the same apartment they lived in on the east side. He wanted to bring, over, bring them over here and really put them into a nice place. And when we added all of that up, I looked at him and I said, well, Hoot, how about an organ in the church in their honor and in the honor of your wife's parents? How about doing that? And it's less than what you would have spent to have them here in Bloomfield Hills. It's $358,000. And he kind of looked at me and wiped his brow and he said, oh, I'm going to have to really think about that. And he left and uh, called me 20 minutes later and said, I'll do it. And that's how we got the organ. It was a very, very uh, easy uh, sell with, with Hoot McInerney. Regis called Red Bowers came to see me and he said, Father Tony, he said, uh, I found a Beckstein piano. It's a very expensive instrument. I know that because my brother Jim is a concert pianist. And he said, and I'd like to donate it uh, to the church uh, for the use of the parish. I'm going to buy it and uh, give it to you. And I thought to myself, people are going to think that I'm networking for special gifts like this while I'm asking them for their dollars and cents. So I looked at him and I said, Red, I don't know how to say this, but I just can't accept the gift right now because people are gonna think that I'm not ask, asking you to make a generous contribution to the building, which you've already done, but they're not gonna understand that. And he said, okay, Father, I'm sorry that, uh, that uh, I put you in that position, and he left. He called me seven days later, he said, well, Father Tony, I bought the piano. Now the question is, does it go to your church or my house? And I said, well, you made it easy for me. Bring it to my church. And then that Sunday, I talked at all the masses and I told the story and the people applauded. And they knew then that's how we got the piano. Jerry was probably one of the most fun people in the parish. She certainly gave one of the most fun Christmas parties ever. And everyone who went to that party had to sing. And I think we hit it off because she knew I loved to sing. So that was a good relationship to begin with. But they were such good people. They were such kind and generous people and very much involved in a, a lot of issues in the parish. But Jerry was um, just a really dynamic person. Uh, people who knew her loved her. And Red was attached to her. And he was, I mean, they were a great couple. My late wife, uh, Elizabeth, also known as Betty, uh, was passed away in uh, April 8th of 2000. And after she passed away, we, uh, as the plaque on the Tree of Life says, we rededicated it to her at her funeral. But also as a, in memory of her, a uh, great parishioner she was, great worker in the parish, great mom, great granny, uh, we, uh, uh, donated uh, with the compliance of Monsignor Tony uh, a nursery called it Christian's Place and the nursery was to give the children of the parish some place to play and we've got the ark in there it's a, a very uh, comfortable happy thing for children and they really get excited when they're in there so that was dedicated in memory of uh, Betty Graham and called after our grandson, Christian's Place. And of course, it's a nice play on words because we are Christians, so it is Christian's Place. And so, uh, thank God we've been able to do our share and honor the parish and the progression of this community of faith. And uh, we're happy to be part of it and see it continue to this day to be the beautiful place that it is.